As we before we get started, then I will I'll introduce our speaker today. Um, Ms. Renja comes to us um, as an MPSE candidate for the environmental science master's degree that we do have here at the university. Um, I will do my best to pronounce everything as best I can, but no promises. I am not a scientist myself by nature. My name is Brett McAllister. I'm the director for graduate admissions for the Hamas College of Arts and Sciences. Um, with me is one of my assistant directors as well, Ms. Farah Amro. She'll be tuning in as well. Um, so with us today, um, as I said, is, is Ms. Renshaw. Um, so the title of her lecture today that we'll be hearing about um, is the use of gastropod index fossil assemblages in providing paleoclimate proxies for the Great Plains over the late Plesiocene. Hope I got that right. Um, she, got, she wants to make sure that everyone knows to, um, you know, introduce introducive material um, will include a description of the Great Plains environment at the time of the late glacial maximum to present day, followed by a timeline of where our project currently stands. A background of our methodology will include describing the applicable use of use, excuse me, applicability of use stable isotopes for the paleoclimate re reconstructions and how we are using a preliminary species assemblages to gauge expected results. I will show photos of the fossils we have collected so far, including criteria such as their species name, preferred habitat, prehistoric range, present day range, and diet compositions. Then I will compare these to our ages for deposition at Red Dog Table, a meso within the Great Plains, where our samples were collected from. Finally, my analysis will conclude a biostrug biostratigraphic chart of representative samples and their ages, as well as a net CDF static model of the approximate temperature in the Great Plains region at the last glacial maximum. So Ms. Corinne, thank you very much for being here. I will go thank ahead and share my screen so that we can view this PowerPoint. And like I said, just whenever you're ready, just tell me next, I'll turn my screen off, but I am listening in of course, and so are viewers, and we will get started from there. So give me one second. Can everybody see my screen? Does that work, Karine? Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, awesome. So like Thank I you. said, with that, the show is yours. Okay, so right now my undergrad thesis, um, I'm not a master's student yet, so this is a little bit um, probably on like the low key side of research, but this is going to be my thesis that I defend next year. So I've been working with Dr. Baldoff and my co-advisor is a mentor at the US Geological Survey, survey um, on our daily campus. It's at the Center for Collaborative Research, and she just received her PhD in paleoclimate reconstructions from the Bermuda and Caribbean area, but she used gastropods, so she's been very helpful. Um, and we're using these gastropod index fossils to provide a late Pleistocene paleoclimate reconstruction of the Badlands the introduction to the area of preliminary research. Uh, if you could just click a few more times, that should be good. Uh, this includes a map of the area. Red Dog Table is part of the Badlands National Park region. The northern half is the half of the Badlands that's accessible to the public, and the southern half is closed off, but we have research permits to go there. And Red Dog Table is particularly set in a good place for our research because it's farther away from any like contamination and people like walking over things as well as it, it's distance from the last glacial maximum which is north and east of this area is further than other areas of badlands so it's pretty much a sweet spot and this um graph up here in the green region the green region of that graph is the Great Plains region, and it's known for their its agricultural richness. And we'll get into how the Badlands relate to that in the next few slides. So this is a plot that I made earlier in the fall when we were preparing to present at the uh, the GSA 2023, so the Geological Society of America. And this is a maturity plot. It's a type of geochemical plot that shows age of sediment and quartz enrichment increases with age because quartz is a conservative mineral. Its hardness is higher than other minerals, so it won't break down when it's transported. So if 
uh, sample has a lot of quartz in it, you know, it's pretty old. And plagioclase uh, breaks down much more readily. So something at the bottom right corner would be older than something at the top left corner. And as you can see here, Red Dog Lus and Nebraska Peoria Lus overlap. And we have a theory that Badlands deflation, which is the transport of sediment from that area, brought this nutrient-rich lust to the agricultural areas of the Southern Great Plains and Mid-Central Great Plains. So there's a good reason to believe that this was the source of the important agricultural areas in our country. And we have not as many ages as we would like. And I know in my abstract, I was a little bit, um, I guess, over eager with getting those ages back. But right now we, we've had issues because of um, aquatic environments in this lower half. And we have the ages of um, the Brady soil, which is at 9,000 years to 13,000 years. If you see that, it's the second to the top. And um, OSLE defines um, the boundary between strongly jointed sediment and weakly jointed sediment. We're finding all our snails in the strongly jointed sediment at the bottom um, half. So isotopes can be taken from the carbonate matrix of snail shells. So when we find these snails, they're obviously not alive in it, it's just their shell but their shell is actually very valuable in that it can give us information on CO2, food chain, dynamics, as well as temperature. And what we're gonna be focusing on is temperature because understanding the temperature during the last glacial maximum, which is approximately 25,000 years ago, will help us understand when drought occurred in this area and caused the deflation to the, the sediment deflation to the lower Great Plains areas. And my professor is very interested in finding out when this drought occurred because it can help us predict drought in the future and understand what atmospheric changes happened to drive it. So isotopes are very helpful because they differ in mass. And the, the main isotope we're gonna be using is oxygen, but I included an example of hydrogen here. Uh, it's hydrogen, one proton versus deuterium, which also has a, neut a neutron in it. So when you run these on a mass spectrophotometer, you can understand the composition of the, the isotopic composition of the matrix that you're looking at. And if you have um, more or less, it will be able to tell you about temperature, CO2, etc. Yeah, so warmer areas evaporate a lot of oxygen-16. So it's expected that if you if you get a shell from the ocean in a warm area, it's going to have more oxygen 18 than 16. So this is not to scale, but I just wanted to show as an example, oxygen 18 will be more um, abundant than it would be in a colder area if it's in a warmer area. So it's not going to be more than oxygen 16 because oxygen 16 is the dominant isotope, no matter what, it's the most naturally occurring. But a positive signal in oxygen 18 will indicate a warmer area and a lower, ox a negative oxygen an 18 value when run through a mass spec and the calculations are done will show a colder environment. Okay, so this is how um, values from a mass spec are calculated. So you have the sample and then you need a reference the reference can sometimes be the water that the organism was in, but if we don't have access to that, it's helpful to find other organisms in that area um, that would have, like modern organisms that would have a signal. But that this can be a challenge in, in these studies on paleoclimate and clumped isotopes have been used more often because they do provide the delta O18 of the water the organism was in, as well as the carbonate matrix delta O18. So uh, VSMO is another common um, calculation used in paleoclimate, but this is just specifically for water. So we aren't going, going to be using the bottom one, but using the top one. And um, these were established about 
uh, well, now it's like 80 years ago, in the mid-1950s, after World War II. Um, if you, uh, Harold Urey, who was actually good friends with Einstein, developed this in uh, 1947 for um, the Bellum Knight fossils that he was finding, which are which are now extinct ammonite, or now extinct, sorry, now extinct mollusk, much like snails and ammonites. Um, but it, it was closely related to the ammonites. So as a calcium carbonate matrix, and he came up with that um, calculation based off of his study of these organisms. And he actually came back to science after being involved in the the experiments for the plutonium bomb, which required um, deuterium. So that first um, example of hydrogen versus deuterium, he actually found deuterium and was able to synthesize it um, to help facilitate nuclear fission reactions that require um, like a moderator so that they don't go out of control. So it was basically slowing down the chain reaction. So he was obviously kind of depressed after um, World War II ended, and a lot of scientists obviously didn't come back to the field, just being kind of guilt-ridden. But he did come back and teach at the University of Chicago and decided to use his knowledge to study climate change and the impact that humans have on nature. So I think that his story is pretty neat. Um, I wanted to share it. But yeah, so our sampling efforts for these snails were kind of accidental. And I joined this project earlier this year, so I wasn't involved in these sampling efforts, but I will be in the future ones this June. So this is the lower half, um, the strongly jointed section. And this is the only area that we're really finding snails. So I focused on pointing out the different um, samples we took from here. If you want to keep clicking, I think it's... Uh, yeah, so it's it's the bottom section right there. Um, <laughs> this is uh, what we found, and I handpicked these out with uh, like a toothbrush <laughs> bristle over the winter portion of the year. So we're finding about three different species, and we are collaborating with a an expert in terrestrial gastropods who has identified these species for us. And he also gave us a bit of information about their paleo environments. So Galba brusa is the one on the bottom and um, it's one of the smaller snails, but he tells us that it's a shallow lake snail and freshwater lakes in particular. And then the larger one in the middle right here is semi-terrestrial. So we're assuming that samples we find the snail in had a somewhat drier conditions than the the former and the latter fossils. And um, back up here, we see Gobbler Bruce again, as well as another aquatic snail um, known to habitate, ha yeah, habitate ponds. And we see decreasing size in these snails um, in more recent strata. So one of my thoughts is that increasing um, drought or just shorter rainy seasons are possibly responsible for the smaller size in these snails and um, that can tell us a little bit about how climate was changing if we're able to prove that to be significant. So I made the plot in the back. Um, it's, it shows the watersheds in the area and this is important because we don't want contaminant water from the glacier um, front to mix with the water that these snails were um, were growing in at the time of their life. And we want the water that they were in to represent atmospheric precipitation because that's how we can configure temperature. And so this is something that I had to kind of wrap my head around when I was like looking into the problems that could occur. Uh, continental inbounding was a strong factor in this area. so. Whatever rain, um, whatever precipitation occurred in these watersheds basically went towards the glacier and the Missouri River was such a large river and it, it still is because of how much water input it received. So 
we're not going to have backflow from the glacier into this area. And I think that's like pretty important to point out. So our area kind of has its own watershed, but its main watershed is um, the Cheyenne River Basin. So based on, I don't know if you guys saw like all of it, but the precipitation comes from um, evaporated and condensated water that was in the Gulf of Mexico. So if the equatorial region is much warmer near the Gulf of Mexico, you're gonna have more evaporation and then more precipitation. So just, we don't have the actual isotope values right now. We're working on getting the snails back from the gastropod um, guy, but we can assume from this that if there's more precipitation, the global temperature would likely be warmer. And then if there's less, it would be cooler. And down here again, we can say it would be warmer just based on the snails that we're finding there. This uh, goes back to how isotopes from fossils can help us understand their food chain dynamics. So with these gastropod fossils, we're looking at what grass they consumed, um, especially for the semi-terrestrial species, Cecenia gracilis. Um, and there's this phenomenon that occurs with seed three plants where, because they aren't actively taking carbon through the bundle sheath um, adaptation that C4 plants have, mm -hmm. they actually discriminate against the heavier isotope because it's more energetically expensive for them to convert that um, into their photosynthetic products. And C4 plants develop during times of low CO2. So they actually try to just take in whatever carbon they can, which results in them having more of the heavy isotope carbon-13. And so if we find that there's um, more C13 in this, we can assume that grass uh, had developed through the Great Plains at this point. And because relatively speaking, it's not too um, far back in geologic time, this is probably what we, this is what we hypothesize to see, so. So oh, we, you might ask like, okay, but how did a lake form in the Great Plains? Cause it's not very hilly and it's pretty flat. And we think that stream incision uh, formed Oxbow lakes, which is pretty much a common like trait in all rivers and lakes that have formed. Um, rivers will meander naturally as the water on the outer side of the river's edge moves faster than um, on the inside. So it it like pushes the river kind of back in and then out once a certain like momentum is achieved. So it's, it's basically like a physics kind of issue. But, but what can happen is an oxbow lake can actually get cut off from this meandering effect. And the sediment has been incised from the river action previously. So further precipitation will continue to kind of funnel into that area and form shallow lakes that might have low energy environments and um, be hospitable to to um, organisms that are aquatic there. So my uh, professor actually made this plot and it seems to show kind of the trend that we're seeing with the snail deposition. So we're only finding snails at the at the very base of the table to about the middle of the table. So above the middle of the table, we think that's when lust started to accumulate um, due to drought and wind action and erosion. So during um, the snail deposition, we think that there were just continual um, periods of incision by rivers and high amounts of precipitation that continued to kind of carve the same path out here and then deposit snails over the middle because of just like overbank flow. And after snails, we start to see the lust accumulate and we don't really find that many snails. We were hoping we would, but it, it seems like there wasn't enough vegetation there and that might be why. So, so Galber Brusa um, was likely living in the the more, um, the, the deeper water conditions of the latest, the oldest strata that we see. So we find that 
precipitation was probably a very strong factor in this species being able to live. And throughout time, um, we see less of the species. So this would be like the the most <laughs> the most precipitated state of this area. Um, Gyrellus parvus is also a freshwater snail, but it can survive in ponds and more shallow water conditions. So we see this species appear more as Gobbler brusa actually kind of competes with it in a way um, as we don't see as um, dominant of we don't see Galba brusa dominating the um, community. And uh, Cecenia gracilis we see in the middle, um, like section of the, the bottom half. And this um, snail would have been able to live in alluvial environments, which are like very low energy, kind of like fan, uh, like dispersal of water. So like think of like a delta or, um, <clears throat> maybe like a, a bay, just kind of like low energy where there's some some ground and some plants. And so Cecenia gracilis probably um, ate vegetation. So we're hoping to um, look more into like the C3, C4 plant preference of these species over this time. So up to now, our data is quantitative inference, uh, qualitative inference, sorry, I can't see it. There's a box over, okay. But quantitative isotope proxies will determine the temperature time series of mid-continental America during the late glacial period and into the present interglacial period, the Holocene, which we are now in. Um, and we're experiencing warmer temperatures partially because of that, but also because of some of the things we do, obviously. Um, temperature threshold catalyst for it will provide a temperature threshold catalyst for glacier retreat at the Pleistocene Holocene transition. So seeing the change in temperature at the end of the Pleistocene in comparison um, to the Holocene will help us identify like the temperature gap that was overcome in order to start this new interglacial period of time. And the onset and periodos periodicity of Dicity, periodicity of drought events afterwards within the Holocenes, within the Holocene might be able to um, be known from the cycles that we see during the late Pleistocene. So if there's like certain 10,000 years of heavy precipitation followed by lighter precipitation, we might be able to see um, that same cycle continue through the next interglacial. Uh, so in the bigger picture, uh, temperature thresholds for past continental glacial retreat and the level to which glacier outwatch moderated global temperatures may help to predict how the thermodynamics and physical aspects of glacier melt today impact global temperature feedback cycles. So this is kind of like the bigger thought behind the project. Um, drier periods and uh, less precipitation might have been caused by more glacier outwash and melt into the ocean, which therefore like it moderated the climate and cooled down the atmospheric temperatures enough to prevent more evaporation of ocean water for, for a certain time, obviously not forever, but this is how stadials occur when, um, when the last glacial maximum occurred and paused at the Missouri River line it was likely because of so much water input into the ocean that it actually cooled down the environment. And we might see that the drier period of time with the semi-terrestrial snails um, could represent that point of that stadial period. So oh, yeah, I, yeah, it's, those were from my paper. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much uh, for speaking about what you've been doing from a research standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, if we do have any questions, if you are, you know, those of you that are watching, please feel free to throw them in the Q&A chat. I know I did see um, a few that did come in um, on my screen as we were, as you were talking, excuse me. Um, so I'll, I'll get started off just reading a couple too, if you don't mind. Um, I know you are quite busy, obviously, so I don't want to take up too much of your evening or those of you that are watching as well. Um, but one of the big ones I did see actually twice in there was you spoke initially, you know, as you're working from your undergrad into your master's degree um, from a the research standpoint, how did you get involved with your faculty? Honestly, it's kind of a funny story. I 
I, I had signed up for another project with a, a different professor who I, I'm still in good terms with, but I, I had taken geology over my sophomore year while I was working for this other professor in his lab with a grad student. And I just started to really like geology more and more. And um, I had an internship opportunity um, partially because my geology professor recommended me and said I knew kind of what I was doing with geology. And um, during that internship, I just had this like pivotal day where I realized I want to study geology somehow, some way. So I reached out to my professor and I said, um, I think I would really want to research with you. And he, he's a very easygoing guy and like it's not as competitive as other labs. So I was happy that I was able to do that so last minute. But um, from like a mentor point of view, I will say that it's good to ask way in advance if you do want a position in a certain lab. And I was fortunate enough to have that, but um, if you do that, definitely make sure like you, you did reach out to someone else earlier in advance. And it's a, the most important thing I think is to just do well in their class and show that you're engaged and that you actually like learning about the subject and aren't just ang like angling for a grade or something like that. So just to find what you really like is probably the best advice. Awesome. Um, another one I, I saw as well. Um, you know, with you know, with your research, obviously you've done a, a ton of it. What are you looking to do? You know, further down the road, with are you going to try and keep going with this type of research, or what are your what are you looking for down the road? I I really like this research, and I think that's why I felt so compelled to like change my path um, this past summer. But I I would really like to get a PhD eventually, and. I'm trying to figure out whether I want to study coral or mollusks like this study um, or snail fossils. Um, but I, I do want to relate this, this paleoclimate work to marine environments since I'm a marine biology major. I think that that would be making the best use of my knowledge and my passion. So I hope to do ocean, um, oceanographic paleoclimatology um, and especially looking at like CO2 concentrations in the ocean, I think is an important thing that we need to be aware of with ocean ocean acidification. Um, so I really hope to like be someone that can make a difference or at least like try to predict how we should mitigate uh, climate crises that could occur. Uh, and I kind of want to just be a crazy professor, but I, I used to want to get involved in policy. And I think policy is important for like, for really communicating science um, for good reason and not just like to get more papers published. You know, it's important at the end of the day to try to use what you know for good. And I'm definitely a believer of that, although it's hard not to be cynical. I think the, the more deep into science you go. Um, but yeah, stay positive and hopeful, I guess. Awesome. Um I do want to ask us for, for my own benefit, um, you know, why did you end up deciding to go to NSU? You know, what was, you know, obviously you said you were an undergrad, you're going to be moving on to our master's program. Um, so what really drew you to NSU and why did you want to be a student here? I really liked the, just, I, I guess the environment. I had visited University of Tampa and it just didn't feel as friendly and like kind of inclusive as NSU did. And I really, I really like that they have a good marine biology program with lots of different areas of research, and they're not just all, um, you know, focused in one area. We do have a great coral program, but we also have this like geology project that I'm doing, and a fisheries lab, and a uh, marine megafauna lab, as well as like plankton kind of. So there's a lot of different opportunities to get involved in marine science. And I really liked um, that. I also run on the track team and it helped that um, I was fortunate to receive scholarship for that. But, but it's, been, it's definitely been a challenge to like time manage both being an athlete and doing research. And um, yeah, I definitely prioritize my future career, but I do enjoy track. And I think that that's been um, a good reason for me going here as well. Awesome. I did not know that you were also a track student of ours. That, that's fantastic. So that's great. Um, I do so I do want to make sure I'm cognizant of your time, obviously, because you guys are heading towards the end of the semester with everything. Um, 
So I don't see uh, any more questions at the moment. Um, so Corinne, thank you very much you know, for speaking with us this evening. For those of you who are watching at home and those of you who are going to be watching later, thank you very much for attending our virtual lecture series. We will be sending this uh, recording out once we get a chance to, you know, Cut it down a little bit and just generally clean up some things and everything as we always do. Please keep an eye out for that. And if you do have any questions down the road about anything, please reach out to any member of my staff. So thank you once again for being here with us this evening. I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday night. Take care, everyone.